Psalm 27, will you stand with me for the reverence of God's word? This will be the last time I ask you to stand before we dismiss. If you stand again, it is on your own and it don't count. 27, verse 1 through 4. Thank you, Tony Riles. <laughs> will you have Psalm 27? Say, I have the bread. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war shall rise against me, in this will I be confident. Last verse, one thing. Have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to what? Now, this wasn't a part of my text, but I just want to read one more verse. Verse 5. For in the time of trouble... He shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. And all of God's people said, Amen. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. Uh, we are declaring that uh, this year or this season of our ministry and all of our churches, that we will lift up the theme, one thing. One thing. One thing implying that we're going to work hard and be intentional on being focused on the assignment. Now, saying one thing can be a little complicated uh, and it can kind, kind of seem contradictory because the truth is many of us have some long list of duties and responsibilities, right? I mean, what is it the one thing that I can do, right? <laughs> you know, uh, some of you already are considering all the things you have to get done this week. And if you're going to get it done this week, some of you got to start it today. Let me see if I can prophesy this. Some of y'all got some clothes that are piled up <laughs> from this week <laughs> that need to be washed. And it ain't one thing, it's a whole lot of things. <laughs> uh, as a matter of fact, I, I'm speaking that some of you will be uh, wearing your clothes right out of the dryer this week. <laughs> you ain't got to receive it because it's going to happen for somebody here. That it, they, They're never going to make it from the dryer to the drawer. It's going to be like, where's my shirt? All right, here you go. <laughs> We got a whole lot of things we have to do, a whole lot of responsibilities. But I want to talk about in this season of our church and ministry and lives about finding the one thing that all the other things flow from. Because a lot of times we find a lot of friction in our lives and a lot of contention in our lives because we're trying to do the thing that God has called us to do. And at the same time, the thing that everybody else is putting on us and at the same time, the things that we want to do. And so I want God to give us a revelation about what is the assignment for the season that we are in. You that are taking notes, you can write this down that you can pursue the right thing at the wrong time. And that's the challenge with the prophetic. That's the challenge with the prophetic. Most of us don't have a challenge with prophetic vision. We have an issue with prophetic perception. I call it prophetic vision versus prophetic perception. Anytime we talk about prophecy, we're talking about futuristic events. And yes, prophecy is a little deeper than that, a little wider than that. But for the sake of this message today, I want to talk about prophecy dealing with futuristic events. You know, things we see that will take place, things that God show us. Now, first of all, I want you to be aware that the hour we're living in, all of us are prophetic beings. Joel chapter two says in the last day, said God, I will pour out my spirit upon what? 
all flesh, not just Pentecostal flesh, not just Baptist flesh, not black flesh and white flesh, all flesh and your sons and your what? That means God still wants to use the daughters. Your sons and your daughters were prophesied. We are a creative force because we've been made in the image of God. And when we say we've been made in the image of God, we're not talking about nose and ears. We're talking about his nature, the essence of who he is. When he breathed in us, he breathed into the nostrils of man what he's made out of. And when he created the world, he didn't create it with his hands. He created it with his voice. He said, let there be. Oh, I feel the Lord in here. He said, let there be. And there was. I need you to look at somebody. And I'm only going to say, look at somebody and say this maybe 20 times. So I want you to look at somebody near you. Tell them, watch your mouth. I'm so tired. I'm so broke. I'm so. Hold on. Watch your mouth. Because what you put in the sentence after I am is what you become. So is a man think of in his heart, so is he. So if you can think something and become it, how much more if you speak it, you'll be it. So we are created for us. And when we speak prophetically, we're talking about futuristic events. When we pray and God reveals to us, I want you to be careful because everything God shows you is not something that God wants you to say. Sometimes prophetic vision is for prayer. He'll show you things to show you what to pray for. Amen. He'll show you things about individuals so you know what to pray for. Prophetic vision. That means when God illuminates your eye gates in the spirit that you can see things. And some things God will show you that you can prevent. And some things God will show you so you can prepare. I'm going to say it again. Some things God show you so you can prevent it. That means you can get in the middle of it and stop it from happening. And some things God will show you says you can't change it, but I can prepare you for it. But when you have prophetic vision and you're seeing things in the future, the challenge is we sometimes have an issue with our perception. Now, when I say prophetic vision, I keep using that word prophetic. And some of you say, hey, Bishop, I'm not a prophet. And I don't have all of those spiritual experiences that you all have. Man, you're not? Are you sure? Are you sure you're not having spiritual experiences? Are you sure God is not talking to you? No, I've never heard God. No. Well, let me tell you, if you haven't heard him, it's not because he's not speaking. He's always speaking. That's why he said in the book of Revelation, he to have an ear, let him hear what he's saying. Because tell your neighbor, he's talking all the time. And we are more prophetic than we consider. That's why you have to watch your mouth. We're speaking all the time. And some of us don't realize as we're speaking all the time, we're prophesying all the time. And some of the ideas you have, Some of the ideas you have, you've given yourself too much credit. Some of the projects you've been working on, you think you're smarter than what you really are. Some of these things and the desire that you have to do certain things. I mean, stuff that nobody in your family has ever done before. The desire to go places that you have never considered going before. The, 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 The holy frustration in you that makes you want more than the mediocre church services and the mediocre spiritual experiences. Scream at somebody, tell them it's God. Because there's nothing in you pertaining to your flesh that's any good they want to do any good hallelujah the desire to build homes for children the desire to do missions the desire to walk up and pay for somebody's food that you don't even know oh i'm just it's just my good heart no baby it's your heart after being transformed by the Holy Ghost. Because you without Jesus is selfish. You without Jesus is greedy. You without Jesus is narcissistic and self-centered. And anything you do is serving you. Come on, y'all be honest with me here. You without Jesus is a messed up, jacked up somebody. I know y'all looking spiritual in here. But if God hadn't saved you when he did, all you would be is dressed up flesh. Come on, with a bow tie on, with a necktie on, with the long dress and accessories and nothing but dressed up flesh 
So we're more prophetic than we realize. But when God starts showing you things, either by way, way of dreams, visions, or a word or an inclination, I got to warn you, it can be everything God showed you, but not the timing in which you thought. I mean, really, imagine this. Isaiah, for unto us a child is born, for unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He saw the birth. And then he says, he'll be wounded for our transgressions. Bruised. Now, I'm sorry. I want to be scripturally integral or use integrity with scripture. He did not say he will be wounded. He says he was. That's how real it was for him when he saw it. He saw it so real that he described it in the past tense. And that's what happens when you dream and you vision and God puts something in you. You feel like you're going to walk out your door and do it right now. He was wounded by transgressions, bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are, we are healed. And Isaiah saw all of that and did all that prophesying. Hear me. And died. And never got to watch it happen. So your prophetic vision can be perfect and your prophetic perception be off so my whole thing is we've got to get a revelation about not the whole journey because you can get distracted by the whole journey <laughs> you can get distracted about I got to get these kids in college and they're in preschool You, you can get distracted about how am I going to do this and how am I going to finish that? Anybody in here? I'm telling you. For example, I just make it more practical. You will walk in your house and go, oh, gosh, dishes, clothes, homework needs to be done, all that. And you can get overwhelmed, Elder Lavelle, by all the stuff that you end up like. Oh, 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 you know what? Who wish? I'm just going to start the mark because I'm, I'm just tired. I mean, it's just too much. And, 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 and the strategy for successful believers who have a whole lot of vision and not a whole lot of time, a whole lot of vision, but you don't feel like you have the bandwidth, instead of focusing on all of that, find the one thing. Find the one room that says, I'm going to stay in this room until I finish my God. And when I finish this room, I'm going to serve the next thing that's in front of me. See, the, the, the revelation of one thing is I may can't do everything, but I can do something. And when I find the something that God has assigned me to do in this season, I'm going to pour everything into it. <laughs> I'm going to pour everything into it. So we're, we're going to talk about one thing all year long. When I say all year, if you're visiting with our church, we uh, are not Jewish. Our faith is Judeo-Christian. That means we are Christians, uh, but the foundation of Christianity is Judaism. And uh, we choose as a church to uh, honor the Jewish New Year. And so the Jewish New Year came in last week. Yeah. Last week. And so when we keep saying this year, we usually start praying about the New Year in September. So when the rest of the world gets to their New Year in January, we'll already be there. <laughs> so I want to even encourage you if, you, if you're not even a part of our church culture or tradition, I, I still encourage you the same uh, to don't wait to January to decide what you're going to do. When you wait for January to decide what you're going to do, you're not going to walk into 2024. 2024 going to be walking on you. Oh, we've been praying all week. I want to give y'all some instructions here. No, really, if you, if you if you wait to get there before you decide what you're going to do, you're going to be thrown around in it. Amen. So we say one thing this morning. I want to start wrapping this down with the subject. How do you keep what you have? 
How do you keep what you have? Because you've heard us talk about all week the testimonies and the miracles that have happened. I mean, documented miracles, miracles without question. And the miracles that have taken place this week that an x-ray machine will never be able to see. Or an MRI can't pick up. Now, don't tell any lies in church, but can anybody say, you know, without a shadow of doubt, there's some transformation that took place in you this week? I mean, really? Oh, oh if you just got here this morning. I don't care. An atheist had to feel God in here this morning. Really, I'm serious. You, it's a tangible presence of God, and there's no way you can come into the presence of God and not be changed. But how do I keep that? I mean, really, I've been in the high place with God this week. I mean, whew, how God transformed my mind this week, how he, how he gave me fresh wind and he renewed my perspective. Praying this week wasn't even complicated or hard. I would just walk in here and open up my mouth and like prayer flowed out of me. I mean, I would come in here for noonday prayer and noonday prayer was supposed to be over at one o'clock and I would find myself at 1.30 still sitting. And 7 a.m. prayer, just who? I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not an early morning person. Now, now, if you want to do something around one or two o'clock in the morning, and if you don't believe me, you ask Brother Enoch. We do some of our best work at one or two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> His wife said, yes, they do. And then we'll even try to call Elder Claude. And he be like, hello. I said, are you asleep, Elder Claude? I was. Uh, no problem. What, what do you need? <laughs> He's really rebuking me in his insides. You know, he's like. Who does this? <laughs> Elder Claude started working for the church. And when he started working for the church, I says, we don't have hours, Elder Claude. So you come in when you can and leave, you know, long as we get the assignments. And I know he was like, wow, OK, no hours. <laughs> <laughs> no hours. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> I was up for 7 a.m. prayer. No challenge. Couldn't wait to get to 7 a.m. prayer. I was waking up other people. I don't know who it was that was sleeping on a balcony over here. Whew, man. I mean, they were going all the way in. <laughs> so I would, I would walk under the back. I was like, hallelujah. Try to wake them up. I can't give myself a whole lot of credit, though. I'm going to tell you what ha helped me this week. I stayed in the church all week. So coming to 7 a.m. prayer, I was already here. You know, and the atmosphere was conducive for prayer. I mean, if you couldn't pray in here this week, you know, I mean, the atmosphere was easy. The atmosphere was easy. All of us could preach this week. All of us could pray and prophesy because the atmosphere yielded it. But my question is, how do I keep it? Because I can't live here. How do I keep it? It would be so nice if Brother Kobe would be in the living room on the piano every morning when I woke up. Then I'd play, play king of my heart. Yeah, that one. But it don't work like that. So what I got to do, I got to go to YouTube and try to set an atmosphere. And because I don't have YouTube premium while I'm listening to a worship song, then here come a dad blasted McDonald's commercial. And I said I was going fast. But now they talk about egg McMuffins and McGriddles. Somebody shout, how do I keep it? I, wa I want you to play this song. This is an old song. All right. Give me C sharp. A flat, A flat. Keep me in your pathway, Lord. Oh, keep me in your pathway, Lord. I don't want to stumble. Oh, I don't want to stumble. 
I don't want to fall. Oh, keep me in your pathway, Lord. Oh, keep me in your pathway, Lord. Oh, keep me in your pathway, Lord. Oh, I don't want to stumble. I don't want to fall. Oh, keep me in your pathway. One more time. Come on, Brad. Help him. Oh, keep me in your pathway, Lord. Oh, keep me in your pathway, Lord. Oh, I don't want to stumble. I don't want to fall. Oh, keep me in your pathway. If you're listening to this message on podcast, yeah, I just did that. Keep me in your pathway. That's an old song where the saints used to sing, Lord, keep me in the path. Keep me in the path. Because ultimately, my desire is I don't want to stumble. I don't want to fall. But if I don't have a strategy, I'm going to stumble and I'm going to fall so how do I keep this consecration? I'm right, just a few points and I'll close out. Number one, keep doing what you've been doing. What do you mean? This week we had established prayer times. Establish your prayer times. I know you can pray anytime. I mean, I can pray anytime. I mean, I, I can, yeah, yes, you can. The truth is you're not. Because time goes by. I'm serious. By the time you get up in the morning, you get to time goes by. And the reason why so many believers are burnt out, because so many believers do more talking about praying than they actually pray. Did we realize this week that we haven't really been praying like we should? And this is not a this is not an opportunity for you to fall in condemnation. This is an opportunity for you to be challenged to grow. Because if you're not being challenged, you're not growing. Establish prayer times. Because established prayer times communicate priority and intentionality. We often talk about the success and the wisdom of Daniel in the court of the Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar. We talk about how prosperous he was. But the prosperity of Daniel was connected to Daniel's posture. We see in the life of Daniel. Daniel praying three times a day. So I need to ask you, what are your prayer times? Now, what are the prayer times that you have that you set before God and there's no notification that can come up that's going to disrupt it? No. What have you communicated to God? I'll meet you at 715 in the morning before I check my text messages. It's cut off my alarm and then talk to God. What, what is that time? Is it, is it say, okay, on my way to work in the morning, that's me and God. And sometimes it has to be me and God without a soundtrack. Because every worship song, <laughs> it's not the language of where you and God is at that time. That's why if you notice in prayer times this week, we, we played instrumentals and we didn't play a whole lot of, you know, we, you know, because it's nice. You know, I love Tasha Cops for your glory. I would do anything, but I didn't need to play that on certain days because some days was not I crossed the hottest desert, travel near or far. Some days was like, Lord, forgive me. <laughs> I haven't given you what you require. Talk about I'm across the hottest desert. Sometimes you don't need a soundtrack of an artist communicating your relationship with God. There are times you need to sing your own song to God. You may not be on the praise team, but you can be a praise team of one to an audience of one. Establish your prayer time, saints. Now, I'm not hooping and hollering, but I'm speaking to somebody in here because I want you to have victory in your life that you don't have to say, Lord, I can't wait for consecration next year. You don't have to wait to consecration. We're still in consecration. Hallelujah. This time of consecration is to help posture us for a lifestyle of consecration. Mm. Hallelujah. Reengage in prayer times. 
Corporate prayer is important. We have corporate prayer times here at the church. Tuesday mornings at 5 a.m. Friday night at 9 p.m. And isn't it something that when we were young and we started in the church, you know, with no cars, we found ways to morning prayer. Then he says that, hey, guy, he said, now you got in your sealed homes. Hallelujah. You got your own cars. And now you're going to say, I'm too busy decorating to come to prayer. Again, it's, it's not for condemnation because if you come to prayer to check a box, then it's not going to work for you. So number one, keep doing what you've been doing. Establish prayer times. Number two, I only got four points and I'll hurry up and finish. Number two, build with community. Everybody said build with community. I just said build for community. I just said build from community. Build with community. I know you've been called to build. You're building your life. You're building your marriage. You're building your ministry. But God's calling and God's strategy for us is not to build alone. You cannot do this by yourself. Encourage somebody to the left and the right of you. Tell them you're good, but you can't do it by yourself. You're talented, but you can't do it by yourself. You're great. Oh, Kobe, you play really well. Cornelius, you're one of the best guitar players I've ever heard in my life. Brad, you got the prophetic cadence of the kingdom. But what makes the sound of this church is not how well you play. Hmm, hallelujah. It's not how good you play that guitar. It's how well you sound when you play together. And many people in this day we're living in, they want to do God without doing church. But let me tell you something. You don't know where you are in God until you can gauge it by the relationships of the people around you. You can think you're sane and you can be as crazy as a bed bug because you're talking to yourself. You're hanging out with yourself and by your, by your own estimate you're the best person you ever met but look at your neighbor tell your neighbor you need community I know you said no I'm not doing church anymore because I've been hurt in church I'm not doing church anymore because church people are wicked church people are hypocrites just like the people you hang out with some of them are hypocritical hallelujah they talking to you and they like you as long as you paying for their food but you found out later they were having conversations about you yes the church is not perfect but the church is God's idea and the church is the only thing that he promised he was coming back for I still believe in the church I've been hurt here but I also been healed here hallelujah I thank God I look at your neighbor tell your neighbor you need somebody I know you got the Holy Ghost but you need somebody I know you talk to God but you need to talk to God in somebody because everything you hear is not from God that's why the Bible even says if you hear something from God that you need to do it in a company of people of two or three people so you can say well I had this dream from God and why, why, you, why are you talking like I, I don't know now, you did have that dream but I don't know if that dream came from God do you say no no for real, I think it came from God okay but tell me why you think it came from God because when I went to bed you know <laughs> I would usually sleep in the middle but I found myself sleeping at the end well you can't gauge that it came from God because you changed your position in the bed you know it came from God when it lines up with the word of God so you can't be telling me that God told you he gonna give you somebody else's husband that ain't God God is not an adulterer. Y'all not saying that to me here. You need somebody. Hey, you need somebody. You need a community because I know even in my own life, I thought something was God and I missed it. Am I the only one? Y'all looked at me and said, I don't know what you. No, anybody you just knew. You know why you knew you thought it was God? Because of what you prayed for. And because you prayed for it and it happened, then you thought automatically it was God. But God ain't fulfilling all of your soulish prayers. Some of you have been talking about your soulish desires and the enemy will bring stuff into your life that you want just to derail you outside, oh my God, of the will of God. I'm preaching to somebody here this morning. I need you to scream at somebody tell them, I want what God wants. I don't trust myself in this season. I need relationships. I need relationships. I need to build, but I need to build with community. If you all remember, we did a whole lesson series on Wednesday night talking about discipleship. You remember that? And we were talking about discipleship. We took a whole lesson to talk about accountability. Now, there are a lot of individuals that have 
a misconception about what accountability is. They see it as big brother overlooking them like the government or something. They look at it as someone looking over their shoulder or people in their business or somebody trying to control them. But I want you to know the simplicity of accountability really is fellowship. Fellowship, it's through fellowship that our lives are changed. It's through fellowship with iron sharpening iron. It's through fellowship with the exchange. Who being honest, being transparent, finding a space where you can be honest and people are sharing their testimonies. You know, we overcome by the words of our testimony. We overcome, not you overcome. We overcome. And we need accountability. We need accountability. Remember, I talked about the accountability in three ways. Somebody you're accountable to. Hallelujah. Somebody you're accountable with. And somebody you're accountable for. Not just with. With is good. But some of us stay accountable with somebody. That means, you know, you, you smoke weed. I smoke weed. So now we're going to stop smoking weed. All right. Now, hold on, man. You're going to keep each other accountable now. Right, right. Did you smoke today? I didn't smoke today. I, I wanted to, but I didn't. All right. Did you smoke today? Okay, I'm being honest. I got a little stressed out and I lit up one. Okay, okay. Well, I'm gonna pray for you. Well, since you lit up one, I'm gonna lit up one. So all of us will be on the same page. We just let we just lit up one today. See, only accountable accountability with becomes swapping stories. So you need not only accountability with you need somebody who's doing the same journey with you y'all in the same place that y'all can understand each other you have empathy with one another but you also need somebody in your life that makes you feel uncomfortable to confess that I need to tell you I don't want to tell you but I need to tell you I need to expose myself, but I don't want to expose myself, but I'm going to do it because it's accountability. Because until I let you in, I'll never change. Unless I let somebody in, come on. Intimacy is into me see. Maybe this is too much on a Sunday morning, but I got to get you while I got you. Accountability with and accountability to and account- account- accountability for. I'm going to pick that four up in my third point. Then number three, if you want to keep what you have, you got to serve. I want you to look at the person beside you, ask them the question, ask them, where are you serving? Now ask them, who are you serving? I'm serving God. All right, all right. Who? Because how you serve others, tell us how you're serving God. He says, Jesus says, when I was naked, you clothed me. When I was hungry, you fed me. They said, hold on, when were you naked? When were you hungry? He says, what you've done to other people, you did to me. Serving keeps you centered. Because when you're not serving, all of your prayer requests are about you. We were here the other day for prayer for noonday prayer and Bishop Timothy was here from India and we were all praying and believing God for different things and he said I need you all to pray he said because I have 24 children I'm responsible for taking care of that's HIV positive when he said that all other prayer requests stopped and ceased all of us started praying for those children because when you start serving you can never trust God To put a burden on you in a place you're not willing to serve. Serving makes you a spiritual contributor and not just a spiritual consumer. Some of you, uh, I want to preach this on Sunday morning because some of you, you come in here on Sunday and I love to see you. And I want you to keep coming. But I just want to know when you're going to stop taking up all the air in here. No, no, no. I I want you to keep coming and take all the oxygen you can. But at some point, I want you to add something to, to the atmosphere. Oh, not for us. I know we'll benefit from your, your serving. But it ain't going to really bless you until you start releasing something. That's when you start getting your footing. Woo. Pastors, am I, I mean, is this a little too much? That's when you start. That's when your root system starts growing. See, 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 if you go to Lowe's right now, there are a whole lot of trees in the nursery. But those trees, their height is limited. Because they're in the pot. They get watered every day. They get fed every day. But until they get planted. 
they can't start really bearing fruit and adding to the ecosystem. God is telling me to tell somebody who's a Sunday church goer, it's time for you to get out of that pot and get planted. You get in the oxygen, you get in the nutrients, but now you need to add to the soil. I need somebody to clap your hands in here. It got a little tight. I need everybody to clap your hands. Uh, somebody shall serve. Serving is responsibility. And oftentimes responsibility is a form of accountability itself. What are you saying, Bishop? Some of us need something in our hand that we got to be responsible for. And that makes us accountable. It makes us look for you. Somebody is depending on you. Some of you, your children, the responsibility of your children makes you accountable. Because parents look at me. There were days, if you be honest, if you didn't have those kids, you might not have would have came home. Even my grandbaby. <laughs> no, really, there are days. No, you someday it was that somebody was depending on you. And some of us, we need that. Yes, you should read your Bible for the sake of knowing God. But there are moments you got to realize, hold on, somebody's watching my life. I got some people that need me to teach them. I got some people that I need to mentor and I need to know more of God. Some, Sometimes you need the people who ask you a thousand questions so you can go home and start flipping and open up your Bible. Sometimes it's the responsibility of serving others will keep you yoked to the assignment. And my last point, and my last point, how, how do you keep what you have? Don't ever arrive. Stay in pursuit. Don't ever arrive. Don't ever plateau in God. You know what a plateau, right, is? It's an elevated plane. <laughs> it's an elevated plane. You didn't got up and you didn't sat down and you can look over. Nothing new for me to learn. Nothing new for me to experience. I didn't experience everything. Oh, I've been in church for 30 years. Oh, my, my, my daddy was a pastor. Have you ever met those people? Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, oh, I know Bishop so-and-so. I know. Yeah. But does hell know who you are yet? <laughs> now, I know your name is written in heaven. But does hell know who you are? Do you make hell nervous yet? Are you so sold out to God that the enemy has to go to the drawing board and come up with other plans and plots to see what he can pull on you with? The Bible says count it all joy when you deal with different temptations. If you still dealing with the same test and the same challenge, that ain't nothing to count joy for because that is communicating that you're in the same space. Mm. So, so uh, don't arrive. Stay in pursuit. This scripture and, and Dr. Tony read it today. This scripture that I read today is a psalm of David. David, king of Israel. David, the one that brought the Ark of the Covenant back into Zion. David, the one they sung songs about. Saul has killed his thousands and David has killed his ten thousands. Okay, if you didn't know those, you know this one. David and Goliath. One stone and he took them down. That David. And I know what you want me to bring up. I didn't want to bring it up, but y'all some messy people. <laughs> David and Bathsheba. Yes, that's the same day. Because, <laughs> you know, I don't care how much good you do. People are always remember one bad thing. <laughs> but it's all right. He recovered from it. And we still name our children David, right? David, David, and he goes on testifying, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord, he's given God the credit. It's the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes came upon me to eat up my flesh, you know what happened? They stumbled and fell. The war shall rise against me. My heart shall not fear. What? He's just, he's, he's boasting in God. And then he gets to this fourth verse. And he says, one thing have I desired. Hold on, hold on. 
David, you have access to more than one woman. You got money like nobody else got. You got your own palace. You got men like Shammah and Eleazar that will fight for you. You got men that you said you were thirsty and you wanted some water from your hometown. And your hometown was across enemy lines and three men risked their lives just to go get you a glass of Bethlehem water. So what do you desire? You tell me out of all you have, you still got a desire? You are Psalm 23, David, and you still have a desire? David said, yes. One thing have I desired of the Lord. And that one thing, he didn't say I'm open to it. He said, I seek after it. You all heard me talk earlier this week when we was talking about spiritual gifts and the baptism of the Holy Ghost and speaking in tongues and praying in tongues. And I've had some colleagues sometimes, they'll tell me, well, I mean, I don't know if I believe in it, but I mean, I'm open to it, Bishop. <laughs> and I told one of my pastor friends, I said, you can't just be open. You got to pursue it because if it's something from God, you need to pursue it more than you pursue sin. He says, I'm seeking after. All right. What you going after? Holy Grail. You already got the Ark of the Covenant. What is it that you're going after? What, what, what nation do you want to conquer, David? Take this. I got a flight to catch. What nation do you want to conquer? What other woman? What other queen do you want to marry, David? What is your desire? He said, oh, I want to dwell. I want to live in consecration. I want to dwell in the house of the Lord, not for position, not to look spiritual to others. I want to stay there for the rest of my life because I want to see. I want to behold the beauty of the Lord. And then listen to this word. He said, and I want to inquire. You know what that means? I want to keep investigating. I want to keep looking into it. <laughs> Earlier this week, I had several conversations doing consecration on theology. Everybody know I like studying theology. Our DC church, this last week we were studying uh, eternal security, uh, whether you want to save, I always say. We were talking about Calvinism and Arminianism. When does the rapture take place? Is it before the tribulation period, in the middle of the tribulation period? Talking about uh, oneness versus monetarianism versus trinitarianism. Now, when I study all this stuff, it's not that I can be fancy and head smart and, and say, you know, I got this. Because guess what? Who can wrap their mind around the vastness of God? I'm in pursuit because I want to know him. I want to know him. I want to know this. I want to know this man named Jesus. Who is God in human flesh? Who died for me? I, I, want, I want to know what was he thinking when he stepped out on nothing before time was. And with one word, he spoke the galaxy into existence. <sighs> what was your ideal behind creating a garden and putting a man in the midst of it? <sighs> what did the angels say? Mm. And I, I want to ask him, what does it mean to be absent from the body? Is to be present with the Lord. Are my family members in you looking down on us? Are they worshiping around the throne? I want to inquire. Saints, I want to tell you this. Don't stop asking questions. Don't arrive. If you want to keep, if you want to keep what you have, don't get settled. Keep, keep pursuing. Because when you do that, 
what people like Brother Hudson say. I want to be baptized. Something else erupts in you. When somebody walks down the aisle, because you know what that means? You start remembering your water passage. You start remembering the day you yielded. When someone gets baptized on the Holy Ghost and speaks in tongues for the first time, you want to just jump up and roll in the floor because you remember don't, don't settle because there's more to God there's more to God there's more to God lift your hands and worship if that's more to God that's more to God that's more to God that's more to God that's more to God, that's more to God. receive Receive, that's more to God. I want to stir a pursuit in your belly. That's more to God. He already chased after you. Now I pray that you'll pursue him. You'll chase him. <sighs> that I may dwell. Ooh. That I may dwell. The Bible says man shall not live by bread alone but every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. I pray today's message has been a blessing to you and that you've been expanded and increased and you've been given the desire to walk even closer to God. If you've really been blessed by today's message, I want you to consider partnering with me that I can continue to get out quality content, inspirational, motivational, and gospel messages because we know it's through the foolishness of preaching that souls are saved. When you partner with us, you're helping us spread the word of God, not just domestically, but internationally, all over the world. And so remember today as you sow, that even though the money or the gift may leave your hand, it will never leave your life because you're partnering with something that's greater than you. We want to hear from you. If you've been blessed by our ministry, we'd like to get your messages. Send us an email. Uh, follow us on social media and take this opportunity to subscribe to this YouTube channel. Remember, I know what it feels like to cry till you have no more tears left to cry. But after you finish crying, don't stop. Get up and keep 